So uh, let's get started. Thank you, everyone, co for coming. I think this is uh, probably one of the last sessions uh, of the summit of the main conference. So thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Fawad Khalik. Um, I am uh, part of the uh, TAP team, and uh, I work for Plum Grid. And I have over here with me um, uh, Anil, who is from Gigamon, and uh, he's uh, leading the effort on uh, uh, TAP. And I have Ridip here. He's with uh, NEC. And um, then I have uh, uh, Takashi, who's uh, from Itakura. And then I also have a couple of uh, team members uh, sitting over here who are from Fujitsu, uh, Soichi, and Kaz. They contribute to Taz, uh, uh, TAP as a service. So with that, um, today's presentation is about uh, TAP as a service. Uh, this is something, the background here is that this is uh, something which has been, which was introduced a, a while ago, I think a couple of uh, summits ago. And you guys must have gone to the presentation at uh, Vancouver, where Anil was presenting uh, uh, with the uh, VNA. And initial overview was given, and some progress has been made since uh, made then. So the the idea for this presentation is that we'll talk about the progress that has been done in the OpenStack uh, community around uh, this, because there has been lots of uh, uh, requests from operators that they really need this uh, uh, feature um, to be able to deploy in their uh, you know uh, cloud deployments. So the agenda for today's presentation is uh, we'll go over the introduction of what is TAP as a service. Then uh, we'll talk about why do we need TAP and if some, some of the you know, problems that are there which are not addressed as part of the current feature set or advanced services, or you might have to deploy tools which are outside of OpenStack. This is where it comes in. And then uh, really we'll cover um, the progress which has been made so far. Um, then we'll also go into a bit of technical details of how the object model, uh, object model looks like, um, how the uh, API is supposed to behave. And then we'll have a nice demo by Anil for you guys on the current implementation. Um, we'll go over that. And in the end, we'll discuss the next, next steps and what are we looking forward to and things we're supposed to add because there, there's, uh, there are some you know, um, uh, features which are not implemented yet, but they're on the roadmap so that uh, you guys are aware of those in the end. We'll open the floor for Q&A uh, for any questions that if you guys uh, have any of those. So with that, let's go over uh, what is TAP as a service. This is, um, this is an extension in Neutron, an advanced services extension in Neutron, um, which, will be, which will work just like you know, uh, firewall, load balancer. Uh, you interact with Neutron APIs. And it will provide you port mirroring. Um, so if you have a bunch of Neutron ports, and you say, I'm going to apply my um, uh, I want to monitor traffic on these ports. You would be able to use uh, this uh, uh, Neutron extension um, to be able to, you know, redirect traf traffic onto or copy, you know, packets from those ports onto some destination port that you can define. And we'll go into the details of uh, how that uh, works. Um, this is something for the operators or tenants um, that you know uh, you should be able to uh, uh, provide uh, networking. Um, uh, monitoring on those, uh, you know, uh, traffic that you capture, and then inside those ports, you might be running uh, a VM, you might be running um, a physical box behind your VTAP gateway uh, that you have, you know, some traffic monitoring software or some use cases, different use cases uh, that um, Anil, Anil will touch upon. And based on that, of course, you can, uh, you know, um, uh, build your use cases on your OpenStack deployments uh, using this tab. This is very raw. Uh, this gives you ability to send all the traffic for those destination uh, source ports. Uh, we are also defining some model in which uh, we, can, we can define some improvements. So that's something uh, we'll discuss in the uh, roadmap for uh, TAP. So a bit of visual on how it looks like. If you're a user of Neutron, you interact with Neutron API. And in this case, let's say TAS is an, ex is an extension to Neutron API. And the way it works is that you have uh, your uh, virtual machines, or let's say, uh, containers provision on these hypervisors, or let's say compute nodes, and you define, uh, and you would want to have uh, your traffic from, let's say, port one and port two, or let's call it source port one and source port two, to be um, copied over to another place in a VM that you can, you know, run TCP dump on or run some some other services on to monitor what what exactly is going on, and you can find like ingress, egress, etc. And you'd have, let's say, a tap uh, as a service, uh, you know, process running on these nodes which will be able to capture this and send it maybe on the same host or across host uh, based on your use case. Uh, this is very high level, and we'll jump in the details uh, of uh, this as well. At this point, I would like to hand it over to Anil and to talk uh, over uh, about why do we need uh, TAP. Thank you, Fawad. Thank you, Fawad. 
So before we go into the nitty-gritty details of how this service actually functions, we'll take a step back and try to find out, like, why is there a need for a service like this in the first place? So let's take a quick look at a conceptual traffic monitoring setup or a process. What does this involve? It essentially involves placing tap devices at some appropriate locations in your network. And in, we are talking here about a virtual network infrastructure. And then attaching some traffic analyzers to those probes. Like these analyzers, once they're attached in this fashion, they should be able to see the same traffic that the endpoints were originally seeing. And it would, these analyzers would actually look like they are actually in line. Now, there are different types of tap devices. A physical tap device is something that you just attach to a wire. A logical tap device, on the other hand, can be constructed by using the port mirroring capability of a modern switch. These bottom switches allow the traffic on some ports to be captured and then replicated and delivered to a designated destination port. And given that most modern virtual and physical switches do support port mirroring, this begs the question that why is it not possible to monitor traffic in OpenStack virtual networks today? So what is really stopping us? The answer to this question lies in understanding certain architectural characteristics of cloud platforms. The two that we have named in here, which are the most interesting for us, are multi-tenancy and location independence. What is multi-tenancy? We all know that in a shared platform like a cloud environment, you would want to basically partition the resources so that different groups of users can actually use their resources without knowing about the existence of others. This sharing is actually done in such a well and isolated fashion that most tenants are I mean, oblivious of the fact that others are existing with them on the platform. Multi-tenancy has some very interesting benefits, and one of the most important ones is delegation of control. If you have worked with Neutron networks, you will see that tenants are able to create their own private virtual networks, setting their own IP subnets in there. They have the freedom to connect these networks using routers, etc. while making sure that in no way are they going to disrupt the traffic of another tenant sitting on that same cloud platform. On the right-hand side of this table, there are certain characteristics listed about location independence. This is mostly concerned with hiding the identity of the physical components that are actually hosting this virtualized workloads on the cloud. The one immediate benefit that everybody knows and appreciates is the ability to migrate VMs from, host, from one host to another host. The main reason this happens is that the VM is actually not intimately tied to the hardware. There are some other benefits of location independence. One of the lesser known ones is that it allows for more efficient resource allocation. VM placement on host, storage placement on these systems, et cetera, are all achieved because of this concept of location independence. So given that we have these two architectural characteristics in a cloud platform, we can make certain observations. One of the observations is that tenants are typically unaware of where their VMs are residing in a cloud. The second one is that VMs belonging to different tenants may be co-located on the same host. And finally, tenant virtual networks often span across multiple hosts. So given that this is the nature of the environment we are operating in, it makes sense that a tenant is typically not allowed to access the controls of the underlying switch fabric. So whether these are host-level virtual switches or they could be top-of-rack physical switches, you typically wouldn't allow a tenant to directly go and access the controls of those switches. Unfortunately, this means that the port mirroring that we just talked about a few moments ago is not available to a tenant. So that is the actual problem space that we are trying to solve in here. So what would one desire? In order to monitor traffic, you would essentially want a tapping service that allows the tenant and or the cloud administrator to safely monitor neutron ports. We want to make sure that tenant isolation boundaries are not broken or compromised in any fashion. And secondly, because these virtual networks span across multiple hosts, we need the port mirror sessions to be able to also span across multiple hosts. Or in other words, remote port mirroring is of very high importance to this service in here. TAP as a Service is the platform-oriented solution that we as a team have proposed and implemented. And we feel that it satisfies these needs that have been listed in here. What it has essentially done is it has virtualized port mirroring, which used to be a switch-level function. 
and we have now brought this facility into the hands of a tenant. TAS will serve as a basic building block on top of which more complex traffic visibility solutions can be engineered. And in the demo, we'll actually go over a couple of them to see how TAS can be utilized for solving real world problems. With this, I'll hand the control over to Radeep, who will be talking about the progress made so far in the project. Thank you, Neil. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Radeep Banerjee from NEC Technologies India. And I'm here to present the progress of TAP as service. So you would see in the demo that the first version of TAP as service has already been implemented, and it has been implemented on the OVS. Uh, we are also on GitHub. So if any, anybody wants to uh, clone the code and work on it, experiment with it, and let us know if you face any issues. We have also applied for an official inclusion in the OpenStack governance for uh, treating TAP as service as an official project. And we are also in uh, conversation with the Neutron Core and the Neutron PTL so that it can be included in the Neutron Stadium. With the help of uh, Soichi and CAS, we have also implemented the TAP as service as a Horizon dashboard. Uh, however, this dashboard, which you will see in the demo, is currently working on Kilo, but we are, the work is in progress to move it towards the master of uh, Horizon. TAP as service is also available as a CLI. So when you, can, when you check out the TAP as service code and you restart the dev stack, then you can easily see how the TAP as service works with Neutron. So it has been implemented here, and you can see uh, the CLIs by Neutron Service and Neutron tap, tap Service and Neutron Tap Flow. As a part of governance and as part of uh, implementing uh, the patches, we have also included Tempest jobs and Gate uh, jobs uh, in the governance. Uh, now for the object model, I would like to present uh, Yamoto Zakashi-san from Medukura. Thank you, Radeep. So, we have two kinds of resources. One is tap service and another is tap flow. Tap service specifies a destination of mirror traffic, and tap flow specifies the source port of uh, Photo mirroring. Uh, let's see how it, wo it works. Uh, there, consider uh, there's two po neutron ports and associated instances. Uh, instances here is usually Nova VM or some kind of container. So uh, we want to mirror traffic on the right VM to left instance. Uh, first, uh, create a tap service instance for, to, sp to specify the destination. And create tap flow to specify the source port and associate it to the tap service. Uh, traffic on the right uh, instance is like this. Uh, we have a field in tap flow resource to specify the direction of traffic to mirror. By default, it, it mirrors both traffic, like this. Now it's a little complicated case. Uh, we can have multiple tab flows associated to a tab service. So, uh, multiple traffic on multiple neutron ports can be monitored by a single instance. Now, now back to Radio. Thank you, Amadou-san. 
So as I explained in the progress so far slide, uh, we have successfully integrated with the OVS. So this is what, uh, as you can see, this is something uh, which we have already implemented and which is working with the OVS. So in this case, this is an agent-based uh, implementation. And uh, in this case, we have got a plugin service which communicates with the TAS agent. The TAS agent is working on the compute node and the communication is via RPC. The TAS agent then communicates with the driver using a driver mechanism and we have created a driver for the OVS which goes, goes on to switching element and communicates. Another option or another implementation which we are proposing right now, which is still under works, is a, a controller-based implementation. In this case, the plugin service, the TAS plugin service, will directly communicate with your SDN controller and the process can go forward directly without the use of an in-between uh, in agent. But as I said uh, earlier, this is still a work in progress and this has not been implemented yet. So for the demo, I would like to call Anil Rao. Thanks, Rudeep. So we've got a little bit of an introduction to the object model as well as two or three, or two of the different types of implementing the backend for this service. So what we're going to do next is we'll do a demo. It's a recorded demo, but it's of a real system that we had uh, put together a few weeks ago. In this demo, we'll essentially show how a tap service can be created, how tap flows can be attached to them. We will be looking at two particular use cases. Uh, one of them is web traffic analysis, and the second one is how to build a centralized intrusion detection system on top of tap as a service. Uh, the demo will involve the use of the Horizon dashboard. We have TAP's integration with that right now, so we're going to go completely through that GUI workflow. And we will then be showing the additional use cases. So let me talk a little bit about the environment before we start the demo. It's a multi-node dev stack cloud. So we have a few separate nodes in here. We have one controller node. There is one dedicated network node, and then we have two compute nodes in here. On the compute node, we are hosting a bunch of VMs, and we also have one special VM, which will be our monitor VM. And this VM has been populated with certain traffic analysis tools in them. In addition to these VMs, we have three systems that are sitting outside this cloud, and they are three Ubuntu Linux desktop systems that are used to mimic the operation of or behavior of three end users interacting with this small cloud. So with this, we will flip on to the demo setup. So as you can see here, we have a multi-node dev stack environment running in here with the controller, the network, and two compute nodes. And on the left-hand side here, we have three uh, desktops uh, situated. So what we'll do in the beginning is from desktop one, we will essentially connect to the Horizon dashboard. And we do that by accessing the URL of the controller. We are logging in as a demo user in here. And once we are into the system, we'll notice that we have our four VMs in there, three of which are running web servers, which are VMs one, two, and three. And then there is the VM mon, which is the VM in which we'll be conducting the traffic analysis. These three VMs are sitting in a virtual tenant network, which has the subnet 10.00/24. And we are using external IPs so that the desktops can access these VMs in the cloud. We'll take a look at the topology view of this setup, and we can see clearly that the tenant has one demo network on which these VMs are residing, and then this demo network is connected via a virtual router to the public network. And our desktops are essentially sitting on the other side of the public network. So we'll begin by creating a tap service, as Takashi had just described. And we are going to do it by clicking on this tab on the right-hand corner. You need to specify a name for the tap service. The description is optional. And the next thing is we've got to select a port, which is the destination port of this service. So in this case, we'll be picking the port for our monitoring VM. And that's the VM where we'll be depositing the mirrored traffic frames. 
Once the service has been successfully created, you'll notice that the monitoring VM is highlighted in light blue. Our next task is to create certain tap flows so that we can start monitoring source ports. We can do it right from this picture itself by clicking on this Create Tap Flow tab. Once again, we give a name for the tap flow. The description is optional. With respect to the monitoring direction, we have three choices. You could do it in the ingress, egress, or a bidirectional mode. And once we have picked the port, if that VM had more than one VNIC, you would have a list of ports that you could pick from. A VM that is attached via a tap flow to a service gets colored a little differently to show that that VM is now being monitored. We will pick another VM for our exercise. Let's pick VM3, but we'll do it in a slightly different fashion, not using the topology view. We'll go into the tap services tab, and we'll create the flow from here. We have essentially a very similar workflow here with one slight difference. Uh, because we are doing it from this tabular fashion view, we need to actually identify the port that we want to pick. So we're picking the port for VM number three out here. The successful creation shows that this tap service now has two flows in there. Going back to the topology view for a moment, you will notice that both VMs two and three are indicated by different colors to show that they are now being monitored. So this concludes the config section. Before we jump on to actually sending some traffic through this tap service, we'll take a quick refresher of the different IP addresses we are using. So VMs 1, 2, and 3 are on the 10.00/24 subnet, and then we have three external IPs to reach them. So let's now go in via desktop 2. The top window out here is showing a shell in the monitoring VM. That's the VM which is serving as the destination side of the TAP service. Now from another window in this desktop, we'll try to send some traffic towards VM1. Now if you remember, VM1 was not part of this TAP service because we are not monitoring it at this point in time. So when we run TCP dump in there, the monitoring VM can't identify or notice this ICMP traffic towards that VM. However, if you send some traffic to VM2, you will notice that the monitoring VM is able to recognize that traffic flow. The same is the case with VM3. What this is that, demonstrates is that the basic TAP service is operational, and our TAP flows are correctly capturing and sending traffic towards the destination. So let's say that we have this service in place. The next question that we want to answer is, what can somebody do with something like this? So we'll pick up one use case, which is the analysis of web traffic. So our three VMs, VMs 1, 2, and 3, are hosting web servers on them. So what we're going to do is we will log in from desktop 2 using a web browser, and we'll start navigating one of the websites. So remember that VM2 is being monitored. So whatever traffic is being generated here because of this web access, that traffic is captured and delivered to the monitoring VM. So in the monitoring VM, we will run a small uh, web traffic analyzer. We are using an open source one, which is HTTP RY. So we have configured that using a small shell script. The website in particular is a binary search tree tutorial. This is just an example. It could be a much more complex website. So we will run the traffic analyzer on the monitoring VM. And then we'll wait and see what happens as this user is trying to navigate this website. So as we start clicking on the links in that website, if you watch that box on the top left, you will see that the activity is being examined and exploded out so that one can figure out what somebody is doing on that website. As the user is traversing this binary search tree and going down the different links in there, you have a full explosion of the time of access, the source VM. The 172.16.2.1 is desktop 2. We have the destination VM in here. We have the HTTP method. We have the URL. We have the response code that the server is sending back to the client. And by the way, this is a very small set of data that we are showing here just for the sake of this demo. This information can be typically logged and later on analyzed more in more substantial and explosive fashion. What we'll do is we'll now go in through desktop 3 and try to access that same website. Now, as a user from desktop 3 is traversing that website, since we are also monitoring uh, this one, our monitoring VM should be able to recognize the activity of this new user. 
So let's go back to the monitoring VM, and you'll find that desktop 3, which is 172.16.3.1, is also been completely tracked. Now, this is a good way for users to find out where their users of a particular web service are coming from, what time of day that the users are accessing the sites, or which parts of the site the users are interested in or spending time in. So having gone through this particular exercise, we'll take a second application, which is more of a security-oriented application. And we will show how a centralized intrusion detection system can be built on top of this service. So in a web environment or in any kind of a cloud environment, like let's say we are running web servers, it's very typical for users to disable other forms of access to the system. So in this example, uh, playing the safe route, we have disabled both Telnet and SSH daemons on that machine, on our three VMs, VMs 1, 2, and 3. But it might still be interesting for a security analyst to find out if somebody is attempting to access these servers. And secondly, if they're accessing it from where are these accesses coming. So we're using Snort, which is another open source uh, IDS system, and it's been installed in the monitoring VM. And we have some rules in here. As you can see, we have rules in here to capture TCP traffic directed towards ports 22 and 23 for these three VMs. These correspond to SSH and Telnet traffic. So if we were to start attempting to access VMs 1, since we are not monitoring this VM, what we will see soon once we turn on the Snort IDS system, that the IDS system won't detect this access attempt. So let's give it another run. We'll turn on Snort in here. It goes through its initialization phase. And once it's settled down, we'll try another access attempt in here to VM1. Obviously, our SSH daemon has been disabled, so that access will be refused. But when we try it for VMs 2 and 3, you will find that our IDS system is able to detect those access attempts. Now, if we try this again with VM, uh, with, with Telnet, we'll find that Telnet attempts to VMs 2 and 3 are being detected. If we look at the output of this uh, snort alert in here, we find the time of access. We have information like what type of access was it, SSH or Telnet. We know where that access came from, what was the source machine that generated that access attempt. And we also have it for the Telnet case. We have shown a very simple use of Snort in here. In, in addition to just logging and putting up alerts on the screen, you could send out email reports. You could be sending notifications to applications that can take corrective behavior. For example, you might want to change or if you find that a particular VM is being hammered a lot, you might want to do some corrective action in that case. What we have shown in here is that by using TAP as a service, you can carry out this kind of activity from a remote and a centralized location. In none of the cases have we put any monitoring analysis tools in those VMs themselves. All of our tools like Snort or HTTP RY were located in a remote VM, which was our monitoring VM. So the original VMs that we are observing are untouched. And this is the beauty of this system that is from a centralized location, a security analyst or a data analyst can carry out lots of interesting analysis of network activity. So with this, we will return back to the presentation. And Fawad will talk a little bit about our next steps. Thanks. That was a nice demo. Um, now, we are at OpenStack Summit, and uh, we, um, I think we were going to some interesting sessions, and we talk about scale and performance and all of those things. And I know some of you have, must have been thinking, uh, well, uh, port mirroring is happening, but um, what happens at scale? Like, so many things are going on, and you have like, several of ports, and you're sending you know, traffic from all of these ports to all of your destinations, and there are several of those. So how does it really play in the picture where the OpenStack is going today? Because uh, we are um, at this point where uh, we're discussing things like performance scale and high availability. And to take into account such uh, aspects, um, we are considering adding a notion of uh, policy-based tab, which is something is in discussion, and we are uh, considering upstreaming as part of uh, uh, the tab as a service API. 
And um, like, if anybody would like to see a demonstration, uh, I have it up and running, and uh, I would like to, I'll be happy to show you uh, guys how it works. And the idea is that you can define your own policies, you know, maybe uh, my, whatever my HTTP traffic um, for this rule, whatever maps, you know, send it to uh, that particular destination. That's the idea behind it. The other thing is that uh, another set of use cases which happen in the tap world is that one other thing is, uh, you're in this demo, we saw that you're able to define your destinations, which are your uh, VMs or virtual uh, Neutron ports. Uh, however, Neutron also supports you this thing called uh, L2 Gateway, which, is, which allows you to you know, um, uh, connect to um, different uh, physical switches and you know, access boxes behind those. And this is where you should be able to you know, uh, define them as destinations, because in the end, they are Neutron ports, and that should um, allow TAP as a service to define them as a destination, send your packets uh, over uh, on the physical switch uh, to those boxes. Another thing that we are uh, we plan to add up is the quotas, because this is where some um, operators might have use cases that they only want port metering, not things like policy-based app, and that's where you can define your limitations on quotas to make sure that you know, um, you know uh, there are no scale limits uh, in that area. Then uh, there might be some overlap between QoS and TAS. It might just be a matter of testing rather than any code changes. That's something uh, we plan to make sure that that's uh, uh, also covered. And uh, Tempest testing is something uh, will be uh, enhanced. There is some existing one added. Um, Rally as well, as these are becoming the standard of uh, uh, testing for OpenStack and the uh, CES support. And also, we're trying to see where does TAP as a service fall in the governance uh, of OpenStack Neutron. Uh, so based on that, uh, it might be a separate repository, or it might be uh, known as an advanced service or something else. This is something still uh, in, uh, in the view. So to just summarize uh, for everyone uh, the session, I think at this point, uh, we covered how and where uh, TAP as a service is today, and what are the things that we are planning to uh, add in the future, and some of the work that has been done already uh, between uh, myself and uh, all the uh, team members, and Takashi has been doing some work as well um, as we plan to upstream. One of the things I would like to correct over here is that the uh, agent based model that we have, uh, the, the controller based model that we have over there, is really works. The, the, it really has to be upstream. Then the demo that I have with policy based app is actually uh, kind of uses that. Uh, this is something we'll uh, upstream as part of the uh, API. And uh, I think this is where I'll open the floor for any questions. One, one more thing I forgot to end. We, this is the information. Um, if anybody would like to contribute to Tap as a Service project, um, we have added the links here. We have the GitHub uh, uh, repository there, um, bugs and files and uh, you know, uh, blueprints are filed on the launch pad, and we have a weekly IRC meeting um, on uh, Tuesdays uh, PST. I don't know what the UTC <laughs> conversion is. And if you want to find us on IRC, uh, please uh, use OpenStack Neutron. And you can you, you have all of our information uh, from the presentation. We'll post it on uh, on uh, SlideShare after this uh, session, so you'll be uh, able to get the information. With that, I think uh, uh, we are able to wrap up. And any questions? If any of you have, okay, we have questions. Yes. Uh, so in the TCP dump, it seemed to show the raw packet, um, but in the discussion, uh, you mentioned timestamps. Is that just the timestamp that the packet? arrived um, from the point of view of the monitoring VM, or is it encapsulated with some metadata to provide that information? Yeah, that timestamp that we saw was the timestamp provided by those analysis tools. So that was the time when the analysis tool saw the packet. OK, so there's no uh, metadata that then uh, uh, We don't have that uh, yet. Uh, yeah. OK, is it, is it tunneled when it goes to, for example, you mentioned it going um, off, off box. Is it tunneled to? Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, our service is using the underlying uh, neutron, neutron tunnels that okay. are there between hosts. We I kind see. of are overloading them to carry out this non production traffic. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So, you mentioned that you've got the L2 gateway uh, feature in your roadmap, but in its current implementation, can I use a service tenant in an, in an admin tenant to source from the ports from a user tenant and pull them all into a single box and use that as a, as a monitoring box for the whole environment? It's a, it's a very good question. Um, this is actually one of the common use cases, because uh, the use cases, normally what happens is that 
there is this tenant aspect, but then there is an operator aspect because operators, one of the uses I've seen is that you have your virtual machines and every machine has like two ports and you, that's kind of a backdoor for you to figure out what's going on. In this case, um, you can, there are capabilities uh, depending on how you use Neutron using maybe provider networks uh, to do this multi-tenant uh, connectivity. And if you do that, you should be able to uh, you know, send traffic across or using shared networks. Uh, that should be possible. Nice talk and nice feature. Thanks. Um, so if, if you have multiple VMs or mirroring traffic to another VM, um, how do you distinguish which VM a particular packet came from when it turns upon the monitoring VM? I mean, I mean, you can tell from the IPs in some cases, but if you're using, say, allowed address pairs or something to uh, have a, a floating IP of some kind, then how can you know where which one particular one received that packet? Um, in, in this case, uh, let's say the demo that we showed over there, uh, you're sending traffic, um, let's say, on the same uh, domain. So you have information, whichever is part of the packet. You're able to see MAC addresses, IP addresses. Um, if you're going across of them, you will still have uh, the information about uh, your uh, destination IP address. And that's something you should be able to give you because that's something is unique in your L3 segment. Yeah. Okay. Hello, very nice presentation, Thanks. thank you. Um, you've uh, demoed um, network intrusion. <laughs> so in network intrusion, it's very important that uh, we're able to port mirror all the traffic. Uh, now, of course, that's not always uh, possible, especially with uh, high throughput uh, pipes. Um, would you have uh, performance uh, charts that indicate how well the tap as a surface is working today? Yeah, we haven't carried out performance analysis at this point in time. But I can answer that question uh, nevertheless by saying that there is the substantial cost to both capturing as well as backhauling this traffic to the monitoring VM. But as Fawad has recently uh, just uh, mentioned in the next step section, we are looking at some techniques to reduce that volume of traffic. So although you might be having hundreds or thousands of VMs in the cloud, by using a policy-oriented tapping mechanism, we can reduce that thing to just the VMs or NICs that you're interested in monitoring. So for example, you could have database servers that you're more concerned about than a website holding some product catalog. So it is there's different types of VMs that can be differentiated using the policy-oriented ones, so that the tapping will be a lot more fine-grained and not exactly what we showed here, where we were pretty much uh, sending everything out. Okay, uh, just one more question. Uh, how, what type of resources are actually used by the TAP as a service? Uh, so, I mean, we are essentially introducing I mean, in this implementation that you saw, we are introducing certain traffic flows inside the OpenV switch. And we obviously have, we, have, we will be using some OpenV switch features, like we are using some tables in there and we're adding flow entries inside that. The switch by itself is doing the packet duplication for us. Uh, with respect to tunnel usage, we are at the moment uh, using the existing tunnels that are there in a production network. We use specific tunnel IDs and VLAN IDs to segregate these tap service-oriented traffic from the production traffic. So we aren't really that uh, heavy in terms of research, uh, resource usage, but obviously there is CPU consumption because there is more work happening on these nodes. And then secondly, bandwidth is getting consumed because mirror traffic is also flowing now in these overlays. Thank you, Thank you very much. One more optimization is this is uh, on the operator side is that uh, um, the, uh, the optimizations that normally operators do is that um, in large deployments, you define affinity of your destination. And um, in this case, you don't have your you know, 200 servers sending all your traffic to one guy. Maybe you segment it in a sense that you have uh, you know, kind of distributed. And from there, you should be able to take it to your central point, um, where this is something uh, is, uh, is an approach which is uh, often used. Um, sort of related to the same point, uh, is there any control if all the tenants on one physical server start off a tab session and it saturates the link 
and the NIC, and I mean, we don't have any. We don't does have the any provider. Does the provider have control to prevent that? And yeah, there are two ways in which we are trying to address that issue. So one is the one that Fawad mentioned with respect to introducing some quotas. The quotas would allow us to limit the number of tap services and tap flows that a particular tenant is permitted to instantiate. In addition to that, using QoS policies, we can basically control the rate at which these mirrored packets are flowing in the network. And then finally, there is outside activity, outside of tap as a service from programs like the group-based policy program where they are investigating ways in which they can decide which tenants get the ability to do, um, do TAP operations. Um, what about things like um, a provider control for aggregate amount of TAP traffic on this source by the servers? You know, uh, like the provider's ability to say, um, I'm gonna limit the aggregate TAP traffic on the server to one gig or 10% of the NIC or whatever, so that no matter what combination of tenants, it will be capped at 10, one gig and doesn't impact the you, you could use a heavy fabric uh, for that, and uh, being the operator, you, could, you should be aware of uh, what, what you expect of that, and that should give you uh, some data points. But uh, using a heavy fabric should be um, uh, a reasonable uh, you know, implementation. Okay. We can discuss more. Uh, guys, if any more questions, we'll have to take them offline. It's 4.51. Thanks. Bye.